When I was a kid, my dad and his buddy would take me out woodcutting deep in the Montana wilderness. My dad's friend, Uncle Kermit, drove this ancient dilapidated truck that you could literally see through the floorboards of. The wheel wells were completely rusted out. The exhaust was chewed through and loud as hell. It was an iconic trailer park menace, almost stereotypical for where and when we lived. Dad and Kermit brought me along, not only for my benefit, but under the guise of making me a man. The real reason was they'd have a young, able-bodied, sober hands on site for most of the grunt work. When I was really young, I think nine years old up until about 13, I'd be the log hauler. Dad and Kermit would slog through the area, bust everything up with their saws and axes, and I'd put it all in piles and then take it back to the truck. This made sure the adults could keep moving, keep buzzing logs, and keep drinking beer, all without lifting a finger to load the truck. By the time I was older, not only was I a resilient log hauler, but I had to drive too. By the time I could see over the wheel, my dad and Uncle Kermit would take full advantage and really get to drinking. This was in the 1980s, in the middle of nowhere Montana, so as long as the driver wasn't drunk, local deputies didn't really care if I had a license or not. They knew one option was better than the other, so I got more responsibilities out of it. I didn't really mind though, as driving the truck and handling chainsaws felt pretty cool to my teenage self. There was one particular trip where everything seemed to be going wrong. Storm clouds rolled in when there wasn't any forecast for precipitation. Then the truck started acting up, chugging at first in town, and then we realized the transmission itself was completely shot. You could shift through the regular gears, but downshifting was really hard. Shifting into reverse was damn near impossible. It just wouldn't slip. So we're stuck in a rambling old truck that could only go forward, at only certain speeds. We were begging for trouble, and we'd find plenty of it out there that day. Everything was going per usual. Three of us were spread out about 10 feet, each equipped with a chainsaw and buzzing everything up in sight. I wasn't as quick as the older guys, so add that to the fact that I had to pile up everything. I fell behind really quickly. We were working along a hillside that gently sloped up to my right and then down to my left. This was my least favorite kind of terrain, short of straight uphill, I guess, because gravity worked against me. Anything that got away from me just barreled down the side of the hill, gone until I had to retrieve it. My dad and Uncle Kermit disappeared up ahead, through the brush and then over the hillside. I could still hear their saws though, roaring through all manner of deadfall. It was easy to keep track of each other and the chainsaws made for good security. They were so loud that no predator wanted to get within a quarter of a mile of us. And if they did, well, we're three guys with chainsaws. We weren't really that worried about animals getting the jump on us. I came up on this absolutely massive old oak tree sprawled out through some still standing pine. It was the kind of haul that would take more than one trip with the truck. So I just went to work, turning out the outer limbs into nice logs before turning my saw in the trunk. It was a big twisty gnarled tree. So I knew it was going to turn my hands into pudding, running that saw through it. Still, I started turning the trunk into rounds. There were a couple of knots up ahead, but I was on autopilot at this point, just trying to finish the minimal wear to my arms. I set the blade between a couple of the knot holes, hit the trigger and let the sawdust fill the air around me. I could feel some rot in the wood, empty spaces where the blade passed through much quicker. After the saw padded through, I brought my boot up and kicked the round as to separate it from the rest of the tree so I could take a better look. This was the worst mistake of my life, as when I bent down to investigate the rot, a whole swarm of bats came screeching out of the hollow. They were beating against my legs, flapping up the inside of my flannel, even tied up in my hair. It was something right out of a movie and a horrific one at that. I froze up immediately, and had the bats passed over me quicker, I probably would have been fine. I was surrounded though, as I felt myself begin to suffocate on wings and fur everywhere. I turned, and panic set in. I started to stumble backwards. The hill itself sloped down and away, so as I moved backward, I started to fall. As I did that, my hand tried to find something to grab onto, and the only thing within reach was the handle of my chainsaw. I squeezed the trigger, got the blade chain spinning, and then ran the whole saw through my right calf. It was the worst pain I've ever felt, truly blinding, as I felt the teeth pull through my skin, then the fat, and finally, 
the muscle. Blood erupted as if I tapped a fire hydrant, literally spewing down my leg and spurting through the air like a little sprinkler system. It was spraying out multiple places, so different streams shot in different directions. I imagined my veins and artery chewed to bits, so I figured there would be no way to stop the blood. I collapsed in the underbrush and just laid there for a minute, letting the shock wash over me. Things were bad, but I couldn't tell what the damage was yet. Had I broken something on the fall? It sure felt like it, and my leg was a mess. I checked myself for bites and bats and made sure they were all gone. Next, I checked out my fingers, my arms. My elbow was racked really good, but I couldn't tell if it was broken or not. It was jammed up enough that I couldn't use it to stand back up, though. The chainsaw was laying behind me, idling hard, chained just a few inches from my hip. I reached over and hit the kill switch, then used my good leg to kick it a healthy distance from me. Again, I tried to use my bum arm to get up, but it was completely shot. The brush had enveloped me in such a way that it was almost anchoring me to the ground. So between my bum leg and bum arm, I wasn't going anywhere. The only option was to wait for my dad or Kermit to loop back and find me. This took way longer than I was prepared for. What felt like an hour went by. I couldn't even hear their saws anymore. I figured they were drinking and waiting for me to catch up. I started hollering through the trees, calling for help that I was injured. No holler back. It was late morning at this point. Well, I wasn't worried about overnighting or anything like that, but, but I was aware of how much blood I was losing. More time passed. I couldn't tell you exactly how much. Midday came and went. I was still alone, losing body temp now, and starting to smell my own wound. I was starting to entertain the idea of death when I heard my dad calling out. I quickly shouted back, trying to guide them up the hill to where I was. I could see them through the trees, maybe a quarter mile away. I kept shouting and started shaking near branches to show them exactly where I was. My dad finally got a beat on me, started busting up the hill. When he saw what happened, his face went sheet white and he almost collapsed. He started screaming for Kermit to get up there so they could get me shouldered and carried back to the truck. The old man wasn't as spry as my dad, plus he was completely drunk, so he really had to fight up every step of the hillside. Finally though, he got to me and realized how bad it was. Between the two of them, they slung all three saws and the rest of the gear and my 14 year old self through that forest and back to where we parked. This is where we had to make some hard decisions. Because of where my wound was, I wasn't able to bend my leg so getting into the cab was not an option. I was going to have to ride in the back of the truck, and someone would probably have to ride with me to keep me from sliding around too much. My dad was a medic in the army in his younger years, so elected to stay in the bed with me and treat my leg as much as he could. That left Kermit to handle the wheel. But like I said earlier, he was drunk. Uncle Kermit was drunk the entire time that I knew the guy, literally sun up to sundown, around the clock boozing, Leaving him to drive us down a pretty steep mountain road, through the woods and finally into town, was more dangerous than it sounded. The only advantage Kermit had was that he spent the last 60 years living rough and rural out there in Montana. He knew every road, every hairpin like the back of his hand. Not even just the roads, but the terrain and all the changes in between. He could walk from one town to the next, never take a single step off course. His sense of direction was really unbelievable. My dad got me nestled into the back of the bed, near the back window right behind the passenger seat. He cut my pants away and did what he could for my leg, elevated it, wrapped it with clean cloth, and then applied pressure. We didn't have a full first aid kit or anything, so what he could do was pretty limited. Meanwhile, Kermit did his best to get the truck fired up, then did circles until he got turned around and set on the right road home. Remember, we didn't have reverse, so we had to be careful where we pulled in and parked. Then we were off, sailing, navigating that old piece of shit through all manner of mud, muck, and washouts. This wood run was during autumn and in Montana. Fall can get pretty cold. Being in the back of that truck without a coat, I started shivering not long into the drive. My dad did what he could to bundle me up, but with the wound, my body was just shot. I needed to be inside and getting treated. Every bump, sent me into hysterics from the pain, and fresh blood would start gushing out all over that dingy metal of the back of the truck. When it started to pool so much that it was filling the grooves in the bed, 
my dad really set to work on it again. This time, he had much better luck, as whatever he did stopped the bleeding up much more effectively. It hurt like hell, but it had my leg plugged up for the time being, as long as I didn't move too much. Things almost seemed like they were going well for just a moment, until suddenly, the entire truck just veered off the road. We're blasting through a ditch, lopsided as hell, with branches clawing at our faces. The bumping turned into bouncing. Every rock and divot sent my dad and I literally flying in the air. Kermit pulled out, got it corrected, and kept rocketing down the mountainside. That was another factor with Uncle Kermit. The truck was his, but he very rarely drove it. The old man drank so much alcohol that he sometimes would just straight up fall asleep, even if he was behind the wheel. There was probably a more legitimate medical diagnosis for this because he would literally pass out with a moment's notice. You could be talking with him, middle of the day. His eyes would be closed and he'd start snoozing right there in front of you, standing up and everything. It was kind of hilarious and always a sight to see. With that being said though, it was a danger on the road. Anyone who was friends with Kermit knew that driving with him was a fool's errand. Either you had to be the one to drive, or you had to be alert enough to shake that old man awake the second he would fall asleep. That just became our new top priority, even above the fatal gash in my leg. If we crash the truck, everybody dies, not just me. I saddled up so I had both elbows hanging out of the bed, kind of wedging myself in place, but also had my left palm ready to bang on the driver's side window if he fell asleep again. My dad was by my legs, trying to keep them still, but also perched and ready to pounce against the glass the second Uncle Kermit nods off once more. It was hairy, scary, and everything in between, man. Being a kid, I actually felt guilty more than anything back there, like I put us in that situation. I felt at fault for putting us all in danger, so I wanted to do as much as I could to help avoid it. We got another couple of miles, which on a downhill mountain road takes much longer than a city or a town. Uncle Kermit fell asleep again, and I mean full head snap, chin to chest, snoring everything. We both saw it immediately, started wailing on the glass. Thankfully it worked and woke him up. It woke him up so fast that he didn't know where the hell he even was and waved out the window like there was oncoming traffic or something. I had to laugh. Some shit just never changed, no matter what the situation was. After two more times, we were almost at the foothills of the mountain. It was only a 10 mile haul, but when you're going back and forth at 15 miles an hour, it does take a while. There was one big last curve before the grade straightened out and started to dip into the flatlands that would take you back to town. There were a few small communities between us and the hospital, nothing that would be able to stitch me up, however. Along that last curve, Kermit fell asleep, and he didn't wake up when we banged on the glass. The truck started to swing wide, really gained momentum around the bend. It was obvious that we were going to roll, and I mean any second now. The back tire already felt like it wanted to lift off the ground and get the whole thing going. I watched in total disbelief as my dad threw open the back sliding window of the truck, dove through the gap, and got control of the truck enough to straighten it out. His legs were kicking in the air above me, kind of like some crazy dream sequence. When Kermit woke up this time, he was furious for some reason. What the hell, Dale? What are you doing? He yelled. You fell asleep again, you old dipshit. You almost flipped the truck. Hit the brakes and let me drive before you kill us all. My dad yelled up at him. That seemed to bring him back to reality. He guided the truck to a stop just before the road straightened out. Dad got behind the wheel and Kermit slid into the passenger seat. I did my best to batten myself down for what I figured would be a crazy flight to the hospital. And it was, at least at first. A little nook of town popped up in a couple of houses and a gas station and a bar. When dad slowed down and started rolling his window down, I leaned over to see what was up. He gave me a quick hard look. How's your leg? He asked. I looked it over before answering. It's not bleeding, but it's hurting pretty good, I said. He nodded. You want to get a beer before we hit the hospital? Whoa. If I thought driving in chainsaws was cool, this whole new pinnacle of the word stop for a beer with my war wound, you better believe it. I said yes, and dad guided the truck into a little nosedive called Crazy Woman's or something to that effect. To this day, it's one of the smallest bars that I've ever seen. Inside was dark, dingy, and the bartender was covered in cat hair. 
We sat at the bar and Kermit ordered us three beers, to which the keeper obliged. But he gave me a funny look when he set the bottle down in front of me. Right away he started asking questions, saying I didn't look old enough to drink. This was a setup of some kind. My dad cleared it up really quick. He nodded down to my leg, which I quickly brandished through my ripped jeans. As dad explained my grisly wound, the bartender lit up, totally blown away that we would take the time to get a beer. So blown away that he didn't charge us for the round, wished us luck, hoped it wouldn't have to get amputated. My dad, Kermit, and I said thanks and then hopped in the truck, blasted off to the next town. We ended up stopping at three more bars before we made it back to town and to the hospital. It was simply too good of a bar trick not to cash in on. Absolutely no one would care once it got stitched up, but right there as an open wound, it was good for at least three beers. I wasn't even old enough to drink. My wound was all the identification that I needed, as this was a bit of a different time. Alas, when I finally got to the hospital, they stitched me up in no time. It turned out to be a pretty superficial wound. I went through a lot of fat. My dad did a bang up job of treating the wound with what he had. I didn't lose my leg, thankfully. I only damaged my liver a little bit. But I can say, I survived. I lived in Tucson during my years as a young criminal. I didn't bother graduating high school. I moved right to working the street, which is really only half truth. I was a party animal who only moonlighted as a criminal. I ran with small crews of guys that I've been friends with for life. They were all involved in different aspects of criminal activity. Everything from stealing, robbing, racketeering, even working as a border fencer or a coyote for those who don't know. Some of these guys could go down to the border and get paid five grand a head for every single person they brought over illegally. The work always varied, but always paid in stacks by the end. Well, after a few years in the street life, I find myself very close to actually living there. It turns out we weren't particularly talented criminals. We made enough to stay fed, stay high, and party, but only a couple of us had a place to stay. Rob had an apartment in a sketchy neighborhood on the south side, and Juan rented a little dumpy house not far from that. The rest of us either crashed with them or other friends, or with girls that we were dating at the time. At this point, half of us were on probation or evading warrants and charges, so mostly just laying low in the way of work. The things that we were doing was a lot of drug dealing. We ran a tight circuit throughout our neighborhood. We had enough of a roster to keep supplied and secured. No one sold anything without giving us a cut between one street and another. That's just how it was. At this point in my life, I thought I was at my lowest. Little did I know that in just a year or two after this incident, half my friends would be dead or in prison, and I'd be living on the street, dodging people who intended to murder me too. It didn't feel quick while it happened, but looking back, it was almost overnight. It's like the old metaphor about the frog in the pot of water. It'll never jump when brought to a slow boil. It was me in the pot though, and I couldn't tell the water around me was already at a simmer. Anyway, I was living between two apartments with two different girls that I was dating. They did not know about each other. This was a little personal scheme that I was running, as I had no interest in a long-term relationship with either of those women. This just made it to where I had a safe place to crash, cash in my pocket, and food to come home to. Dating these women was my version of a safe house. Judge me if you want, but it served its purpose and everyone was happy. One night, we were all holding counsel at Rob's apartment, as we normally did. It was up on the third or fourth floor, so it had a nice view of the neighborhood and let us feel like underworld royalty. Honestly, the place was a dump. Stained walls, holes in the drywall, dirty floors, burned carpets, the whole nine. It was a cross between a crack shack and a frat house. It was headquarters, the party place, and where we'd hang out on days we didn't want to do any of that. One night, we were counting money and talking business, but everything just kept coming up short. Our average rake for the week was usually double whatever it was we had on hand, so we knew something was up. That's when in passing, our friend Moose mentioned that he saw someone dealing in our stretch of turf. He didn't do anything about it, as Moose was one of the guys on probation, so we just followed the guy back to his house and got a visual on that place. 
looked like a pretty average apartment. No outside decor except for a smoking chair. We all took great interest in this, and a select few of us hopped in Rob's car to go scan the place. A few others laced up to do a walk by. The rest of us just stayed at the house, ready to roll out at any sign of trouble. Moose stayed back, and as did I. He filled us in on what he'd already seen, as he staked the place out for a couple of hours the night that he found it. He said it was average traffic. A couple of people would come and go every hour. Pretty obvious some kind of sale was going on. Others would come and stay a little longer, then eventually leave. Then sometimes, randoms would leave the house, people he never saw enter, which told him there was at least some kind of assortment of crew inside, more than just dealers probably. A couple of hours later, we got our answer. The people on foot got back first, then Rob barreled in with the car, parked around back to keep it off the street, and hustled up to the apartment. Our buddies on foot had already filled us in a bit. They did a little stake out of the apartment. When they were sure sales were being made, a little group approached the door and knocked. They pretended to be looking for a pickup. The people in the apartment let them right in, at which point our crew hardened up. A couple even drew guns. They unlocked the door behind them and let in even more of our crew, who ransacked the place, and then everybody fled. They issued a warning before they left, though. This was a claimed area and no one would be stepping on us. Find somewhere else to conduct business. With that, everyone retreated back to Rob's. They did it carefully to avoid being followed back. What they came back with was in the ballpark of $25,000 worth of street value. I'm talking pounds on pounds of weed, ounces of cocaine, and piles of all kinds of pills. It was the exact kind of come up we were looking for. And it was between crews, so it's not like our probation officers were going to hear about it. Ripping off a dealer isn't like knocking off a 7-Eleven. Repercussions are between people, and the laws they decide for themselves. Well, over the next eight months, our crew completely fell apart. A bunch of us got caught up in a raid over at Juan's house. The others got picked up on corners and back alleys making deals. Those who didn't get jammed up by the law ended up catching beatings or even worse. All at the hands of who we assumed was the other crew that we ripped off. Word was that the guy that we ripped off wasn't just a little street team like us, but an extension of a real gang somewhere in the valley. They were coming to test the waters in Tucson as they had affiliation with cartel associates. This means these guys were not to be trifled with, but we had no way of knowing that. We were way too quick on the trigger, and after the night that Rob and the guys ripped them off, it sealed our fate. They made one call. The cartel honchos had our number. It was dicey everywhere. Very quickly, we realized that nowhere was safe. Even of the girls that I was shacking up with got wise that times were seedy. She gave me the boot. I couldn't really blame her, but damn, I was pissed at her. People are getting locked up or killed, and you shut the door? Ruthless. But again, I get it. There weren't many of us left by the end of those eight months. Whittled down from 20 to just five or six. It was hard to tell, though, because more of us were scattered to the wind every single day. Getting out of town, or at least out of the neighborhoods before things got any worse. It felt like hunting season was on, and we were the only game out there. We couldn't sell drugs anymore. No one would do business with us of any kind. I mean, we could get little things here and there, but the big transactions, forget about it. There was no way for us to get ahead anymore. Definitely no work coming our way. It's like we were wanted, so putting us to work would be like painting a target right on your back. We just continued to lay low. Every now and again, we would get together at Rob's apartment, get drunk and just shoot the shit. We compared notes on stuff that we'd heard, what went on through the hood, and just general counsel. It was a true wonder that this place never got raided. We'd somehow kept it secret this whole time. There was a small victory in that, even if we lost everything else. And lost we had. The guys that were left were getting seriously desperate. Most of us had jobs, even throughout the criminal string, even if it was just working the register at a gas station. Now, that's all we had. And even then, none of us wanted to work too local for fear of getting recognized. We needed to more satisfy the habits that we had, let alone cover overhead. Some of the guys were talking about going back to dealing, maybe on a different side of town, but others were talking about even more drastic action. Break-ins, robberies, ATM holdups, jam up a stash house like when we started this downhill spiral. Anything to turn a real dime just to come up a little. That was against the rules though, and we knew it. 
The agreement was to lay low for just a little while longer and eventually start popping up individually. It'd be easier to get in somewhere alone, without a crew, without working alongside the prior team. Shedding the reputation would help us all in the long run. I'm not sure that ever even came to fruition. Exactly one week later, I was supposed to go over to Rob's house and just kick it for the evening. I was hanging around with the girl that I was still seeing. She and I had actually gotten more serious because the other girl had walked. We spent more time together, got more intimate. Soon, I was hanging out far more than I ever did before. It was nice having more than just a physical relationship, but to actually hang out and share meals, watch movies, all that good stuff. It was the perfect thing for laying low. I got to stay home every single day and enjoy myself doing it. Well, the girl and I ran the clock, and I was getting laid over to Rob's, but only by 15 minutes. I was walking over there, and as I was leaving the house, and during my trek over to Rob's, I could hear sirens here and there. I don't know why, but it just gave me this weird feeling. They were all heading in the direction of Rob's apartment. I continued walking that direction, certain that it was just a coincidence. But lo and behold, his whole complex is taped off in every direction. The block is swarming with cops, detectives, heavily armored tactical teams, even canines, frothing up and down the sidewalk. It was damn near like a mini war zone. I called Rob for my cell, but there was no answer. Now I had to see for myself what the hell was going on. I walked around to the back of the building, where there's a plain metal door that allowed access to the building itself. It was kind of blocked by some bushes on the outside. Some genius had also painted employees only and stencil across both sides. It made it look halfway official, and no one ever really used it. Hell, there was a time that building was being torn through by cops, and we got some of our friends out through that door. It was just a little known secret of longtime renters. I got in but didn't even make it to the stairwell before some cops busted me. They didn't draw guns or anything, but they were stern, very serious about how the hell I'd gotten inside. I told them about that door. I gave up the secret exit of the ages and explained that I was just here to visit my friend and he wasn't answering his phone. I said I was late. I had a bad feeling about whatever the hell was going on. They asked what unit he was in and I said the number. Both guys shook their heads and said, sorry, that's who we're here for. I was devastated, but not shocked. Like I said, the second I heard those sirens, I just had this bad feeling. Now, I had the confirmation. Both the cops said something weird then, said, Hey, since you know the guy, why don't you give us a statement so we'll have somewhere to start? It'll really help the investigation. Maybe get some justice for your friend. I said okay, and they brought me up to his apartment. I wasn't allowed to go inside, but they told me what they thought happened. Someone had entered the complex, came straight up to his unit. They knocked once, loud and hard, waited for Rob to open up the door. The moment that he did, they discharged a 12-gauge shotgun three times in rapid succession, which effectively cut my friend in half at the waist. Now, I was in shock. It was the worst thing that I ever heard in my entire life, and as you can tell, I wasn't very sheltered. I gave them the cleanest version of a report that I could, short of the robberies and drug dealings. I told them about a local crew who had that cartel affiliation. They moved drugs in bulk, they were armed, and they'd been involved in lots of violent activity in the city over the last year. I even told them where the original apartment was. The detectives wrote everything down, but the moment that I mentioned the cartel, they didn't seem super interested in a follow-up. I got the hell out of that town, and I mean that night, with clothes on my back. I told my girlfriend what had happened. She swung by to pick me up, and I told her to drop me off at the bus station. I was catching a ride out of Tucson, she asked me where, and I said I was going anywhere away from the border. I had to hide for at least a couple of weeks, but in reality, I disappeared for a couple of years. I found myself on the streets of Flagstaff for a short stint, before the weather got real and the cold sent me packing. Phoenix caught me next. I lived on the streets for almost 10 months. I even turned myself in for some minor crimes just to get on probation, have a routine, and have a check-in. In my mind, I was still being hunted, so being on a radar was good for me. It also gave me a peace of mind for anything catching me up down the road. I was on and off inside 18 months, and I found a room to rent inside that time. Rob had a lot on the hook. 
He was one of the few guys in the crew that actually had a roof over his head. So he had rent, a car payment, insurance, utilities. The guy had real bills. It wasn't just parties for him. So when everything dried up, he got hit the hardest and became the most desperate. He rolled a couple of those corner guys, rolled a stash house, and eventually, somebody followed him home. You can only assume that they were part of that original crew that we ripped off to begin with. Here is the scariest part, at least for me, and this isn't even me speculating, but exactly what those detectives told me the night that Rob was murdered. They said, had I been on time, I would have walked in literally minutes before the shooter arrived to the building. When they knocked, they would have shot us both point blank, absolutely no doubt about it. They said I was incredibly fortunate to have been late that night. It literally saved my life. That's why I was so desperate to leave that night. I knew that my luck was not going to last. When you survive something like that, you don't keep living the same way. You take a serious inventory of what you have and what you want and what you value and then prioritize from there. Rest in peace, Rob, and everyone else not around from those days. During COVID, my entire life fell apart at the seams. Money quit coming in. We couldn't leave the house. My wife and I were already growing distant. Her son and I have never been close. Jan and I got married late in life when Luke was already born and pretty much grown. I knew him as an angry, borderline violent young man. He was a bully throughout his time in school, a vandal to the public. I don't think I ever saw him smile, hand to God. The kid was never happy or in a good mood at all. He was like the kid out of a cartoon with just a thundercloud over his head all the time. When I stopped working, we all got cooped up in the house and things spiraled out of control. We couldn't talk to each other, let alone look each other in the eye after just six or seven months. Everyone drank, everyone smoked, and the place quickly grew very unstable. I knew things wouldn't last, so I started quietly packing my things, planning my escape. I'm a plumber by trade, I have no trouble finding work, so when things opened back up, I quietly saved my pennies. By the end of the first COVID year, I had a decent little stash of money, and I would totally rehabilitated our old motorhome which was one of those old trucks with the camper on the back, but fully outfitted it. It was going to be my chariot to freedom. Things had gotten crazier than a shithouse rat in our home, though. I fought with Jan every single day. Screaming matches, shoving matches, all the crap that leads to jail time. I wasn't about it. I didn't want to fight with anybody. Luke was even crazier, spending every waking moment on the internet. He'd gone from a high school bully to a stereotypical conspiracy theorist. Everything was a government cover-up, a chemtrail, Chinese act of terror. He lived in a fantasy land, and because of that, had grown even more violent and unpredictable inside our household. More than once, our interactions turned physical. Once while we were having an exchange in the kitchen, I just simply turned my back to him and went back to my business. I was done with the conversation because it was going nowhere. I opened up the fridge to get something to eat. And this kid comes up behind me, my own stepson, and wraps me up with both arms, squeezes the air out of me, and pulls me back closer to the counter. He threw me to the side, slammed the fridge door closed, took out a knife out of the block. He then threatened me at knife point, saying that we don't eat under the same roof, and all this other batshit fringer elitist alpha shtick that he gets off the web. It was scary as hell being picked up like that. I'm obviously older, but also a good deal smaller than Luke. He could have killed me if he wanted to, with or without that knife. I just went limp after he hoisted me in the air, like I was already dead or something. But I could feel something more than that. I could feel how angry he was. I don't know how, but I could just feel his animosity and how badly he wanted to injure me in that moment. It was really bizarre, and I've never felt anything like it since. Another time I was bringing in groceries. Jan was berating me for not getting enough or not getting the right product, some other minor inconvenience. I snapped back and defended myself. Then here comes Luke, barreling down from the upstairs bedroom, immediately smashed his forehead into mine. This was just as I was turning around from the car trunk, arms loaded with groceries, so I couldn't really defend myself. He clocked me so hard that it rattled my teeth, totally shook my brains up. 
Then he pushed me hard enough that I fell back into the trunk. From there, I panicked, as I'm very claustrophobic. I knew Luke would be crazy enough to shut the hatch and lock me in there. I dropped the grocery bags and scrambled to my feet, just in time as I saw those gears turning. He realized then he could have done it. I told him that I was calling the police, at which point he and Jan cooled off and went back inside. I brought the groceries inside but made sure to avoid them both for the rest of the day. After that incident, I made leaving my top priority, above even getting divorce. I finally told Jan what was going on, that I wanted to leave as well as get separated, but she wasn't having it. She took right to berating me, saying that she would never sign anything and would never do anything to spare me any difficulty. She wouldn't lift a finger if it meant making something easier for me. All right, so be it. Anything is better than here. I took my last of my belongings and drove the motor home right down the road. I didn't really have a plan for that night, but I had a plan for my future. I milled around the city for a couple of days, got my road legs under me and learned the ins and outs of trailer living. It wasn't so bad. I kind of liked being able to relocate at a moment's notice. After 10 days, I stocked up on some supplies and jumped the border into Mexico. I spent that first night on a beach, didn't even know the name of, drank beer that was pretty much free, and saw more stars than I've ever had in my entire life. Life went a little weird for the first couple of months, but freedom tasted so damn good. As I mentioned before, I'm a plumber, so there was still work everywhere. Lots of people needed little odd jobs done, and they would pay me in all sorts of helpful ways. I got to know people in my community, and even learned a little Spanish. Having lived in California for so long, a lot of it seemed to come naturally. I kept up with some friends back home, and everything I heard sounded par for the course. Jan would not grant me the divorce, and so I had gone back to her old ex-husband, Luke's real dad. The household was more of the same, screaming, holes in drywall, cops in the driveway every single night. After a few months of being away, I felt more than happy with my decision living my childhood dream on a full-time road trip, and the people I left behind were still suffering. Not that I really wished that, but the hell they put me through was enough for me to think that it was justified. I got a call just a few weeks ago, a month at the most, and I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I turned to the internet and looked up the story. Headlines were everywhere, pictures of people that I knew. I dodged a bullet, literally, but not at the cost of others. Luke had finally snapped. He drank enough, smoked enough, and spent enough time online reading those conspiracies. One day, something just sent him spiraling so hard that he went into his room, got a gun, and shot both of his parents right there in the house. Then he left the gun on their bleeding corpses, went about his normal business the rest of the day. When authorities found their bodies and reached out to Luke, he told them it must have been a murder-suicide. His parents had been fighting for a long time. It was a real tragedy. The police didn't buy it for a second. The crime scene was painfully obvious. The staging was horrendous. These people had been shot by a third party. The gun had been lazily dropped without any inclination of ballistics. Luke got locked up and is currently facing double homicide charges. Jan and her husband are dead. So I got my divorce in the most horrific way possible. Had I stuck around any longer, it could have been my corpse discovered right next to Jan's, the bullet hole still leaking. This was a national headline for this year. You may find it, but their names won't be Luke and Jan. I still go back and forth to Mexico, but everything is different now. It's hard to feel good about a lot of what I remember. The whole thing breaks my heart, as what I survived is a tragedy, regardless of who it happened to. That kid was a ticking time bomb and I just managed to get out of the way in time. 